Thank God they fired me because uh, had they not done that, I would have put every dollar that I had into the company and it would not have made a difference. You know, I didn't invent photosynthesis or gravity or electromagnetism. <laughs> Most of like what I'm making in my life is like, you know, like a little nudge on top of all this stuff that, you know, I just had the gift of being born into. Tonight, uh, this, is, this is a privilege for me, um, because Cameron and Tom, they've been uh, two of the most long-standing mentors from the very start of Unreasonable, and have come out time and time and time again. Um, they also, their bios are, like most people here, I mean, remarkable. Cameron, I, th I think you've founded 10 companies, been on the founding team of 10 companies. Three of those billion Three dollar companies? Three of them failed, uh, got fired twice. <laughs> got fired twice. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> Keep going. Six of them were successful. Of the six, three of them were M&A and uh, three of them were IPOs. Three IPOs. And the uh, IPOs were all multi-billion dollar IPOs. So. <laughs> so. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Long time ago. That was a long time. Okay, you can be humble about that. That's hard to be humble about. Um, it wasn't that long. Com yeah, Comrade's bio, um, Tom, um, the entrepreneurs, you've, you've met Tom. I think he's one of the most prolific inventors um, and also gurus of our time have run multiple billion dollar budgets, was on the founding team with Google Glass and the self-driving car and, and it kind of goes on and on and on and on and on. Um, but what we often do... We go to do, Tom to learn, okay? Yeah, we, so, yeah. <laughs> he's our guru. Yeah, both. <laughs> I'm looking forward to this because like whenever Comrade actually, he's like a really good storyteller. So yeah. I actually imagine this is like, Daniel asks one question and Comrade yeah. will talk for 18 minutes and I'll be like, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was my story. story. Come on. <laughs> I go and sit in these sessions. I learn every time a lot. I do. So, so tonight though, um, what I want to do, and, and I think you two are comfortable and vulnerable enough to, to do this. Um, but it's easy to talk about the successes. Um, and actually, you started by admitting your failures. Um, but what I'd like to go into is uh, the grit and the pain of the failures that have been along this road towards success. Um, but I'd, li I'd like to start with stories, and then we'll extrapolate on lessons. Um, now, we, we only have 20 minutes. <laughs> so uh, for these stories, um, just a couple minutes. But maybe, Carmen, we can start with you. And then, Tom, I'd love to hear um, either the greatest failure or when it was hardest, when it was toughest, when it was really painful on, on this entrepreneurial journey? Well, uh, the toughest one was uh, my third company called Momenta. Uh, since we don't have time, just imagine <laughs> iPad about 20 years before iPad. And uh, it was after two successful uh, uh, companies that I had. So investors would throw money at me like crazy. This was in the 80s. And... Uh, I got 40 million bucks, uh, hired an amazing team, and uh, we had uh, our first year orders uh, for 300 million uh, dollars, and I thought that uh, we can't do anything wrong. I was so much full of pride in the success of my first, second company. I thought it uh, wouldn't go wrong. So I promised my investors I cut it by two thirds. I saw our first year revenue would be 100 million. And uh, we shipped the first quarter 5,000 units. We were selling them at $5,000 a piece. This was 1992. $5,000 uh, iPad. $5,000 iPad, 1992. <laughs> and uh, first quarter was 25 million. We thought everything is great and whatever. And we are all celebrating. And then they all started to come back. <laughs> 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 and uh, remember this was before he mentioned of internet, before he mentioned of wireless, before he mentioned no websites, nothing, how do you communicate with people. Uh, we had designed this, you know, iPad, iPhone, have one button. Uh, I had a dream that in my dream I was reading Wall Street Journal on uh, uh, iPad and uh, mm -hmm. it was an article on uh, automotive industry and there was an ad for Japanese car company Honda and in my dream I went and I touched it and it gave me a color video So I tried to build it and in my dream it had no buttons So Momento computers if you go and check it out Momento computer you will see it had no buttons and uh, People didn't know how to use it it all came back as people said, How do you use this? This doesn't work. All they had to do was put their goddamn finger on it <laughs> 
or put a pen on and it would wake up. <laughs> They returned it and it was a very expensive lesson. Uh -huh. right? It was April 1st, 1992. April 1st. April 1st, 1992. I had hired uh, the COO of Apple to be my COO. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to the office uh, to go to work and I saw there is a board meeting going on. And uh, I said, I'm the chairman, CEO, founder, whatever. I didn't call a board meeting. We said that well. <laughs> He called us up and uh, you're fired as of today and uh, pack your bags and leave and uh, it was not fun. Did you think it was it, a joke? I thought it was a joke. Well, I, I really thought that it was a April Fool's Day joke oh. because uh, I had made all of my investors so much money. You know, my, mm. second, my first company, we sold it in less than three years for 75 million bucks in 1984 and second company was Serious logic, which was worth 3.5 billion. So I couldn't believe my investors who had made so much money off of me would fire me. But uh, they showed me the way, and uh, it's your baby. And uh, it was very hard, but it took me a year to get back on my feet and figure out what I wanted to do with my mm -hmm. life. And thank God they fired me because uh, had they not done that and had they backed away from uh, funding me, I would have put every dollar that I had into the company and it would not have made a difference because uh, majority of my uh, engineers went to Apple and they work on a product some of you might remember called Newton mm -hmm. and <laughs> Apple put about 400 million into that and uh, that was a failure also failed. so <laughs> thank God they didn't let me <laughs> be there to do that so universe has a strange way if it is tough just accept it whenever you hit a big uh, problem don't let it, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, it really does. And uh, because of that, I became so much more humble and I figured out, okay, my shit does stink and I, <laughs> I'm not so great and I make mistakes. And uh, if you look at all the cars that I have uh, ever, I've every four or five years I buy a car, I always carry the Momento uh, license plate on it. I don't put Cirrus Logic or Neo Magic yeah. or Centilium. I put <laughs> Momenta Computer, my biggest fuck up. And, uh, <laughs> it's a very quick way to be humble oh, every day yeah. that you come to work. So. <laughs> we're we're, we're going to go deeper. But uh, Tom, I'd love to hear. And <laughs> I, I, all I'm curious is, is I, well, I think a lot of people look at you two when we read your bios and we see you speak in front of you know, audiences from afar. We, we think that you're almost invincible. And so I'd love to know just what rock bottom was like or when it became hardest, similar to Comrade's story. Yeah, like which one? So let's yeah. see. <laughs> uh, I mean, there's like the, the classic go-to and it's, it's, it's true and useful. So yeah. we'll share it. But... Yeah. Uh, so I was an up-and-coming executive. I was getting like promotions like every six months. Like this does not happen normally. And like little by little, you know, a team was growing, team was growing, team was growing. But I had this habit, like part of the reason I was getting all these promotions was no matter what would happen, we would power through, we'd ship on time, we would ship stuff that was more impressive than what anybody expected. Mm. And the way that I was actually doing it was like at every scale, like when people would have anxieties or problems or whatever, I'd be like, don't worry, I'm gonna take care of it. I basically absorb the anxiety from them hmm. and just work that much harder in order to close the gap. And when you got a team of five, it's okay. It's like, <laughs> it's few enough people, you can do that. You got a team of 30, starting to get a little bit tough. You got a team of 50, you just like absorb the anxieties of 50 people. And like, there's like plenty of cues, but I didn't totally get them. I would like, you know, go to work every day and like, get a full like 16 ounce cup of ice and just chew ice day the day. <laughs> you know, while literally, I was, yes, literally. while I was yeah. uh, doing my work and absorbing on. And like, wow. I didn't recognize it, but like, you know, my body in various ways was shutting down. And like mm -hmm. the, um, I was home for the holidays and like right in the middle of a particularly tough passage, you know, one of the, uh, the senior execs was basically saying, hey, this project, you know, we need to take this staff, like we're gonna shut down the project. It was a project that, you know, uh, I knew the people that were rallied around it, like really believed in it. We we're very close to getting it done. 
you know, I was, I was like really petitioning to just get a couple more months, like really like six weeks, yeah. and we were going to go deliver on a thing that we'd spent, you know, half a year on. But they're like, no, it's going to end, it's going to end. And I had internalized all that. I was at, um, I was home for the holiday break, 29 years old, and I was like hanging out with my friends, playing video games, I don't know, that's what we do. Like we pretend, like we're, yeah. we pretend like we're 15 again <laughs> when we hang out. And like, I, I like, you know, during break I like get up to, to go to the bathroom. Before I get there, I like collapse in the hallway. Mm -hmm. And what had basically happened was my, my lower GI tract had exploded and I lost 40% uh, of my blood in less than half an hour. Whoa. Uh, and they basically, they rushed me to the emergency room and initially because it's internal bleeding, they can't tell what's happening. Mm -hmm. But then when they, when they got in there, it was like, oh my God, this person would die for sure. And like, it, you know, usually something like this happens, like give you a blood transfusion. Mm -hmm. But like the rate at which I was dying, they basically had to give me four simultaneously tra uh, transfusions wow. mm -hmm. in order to like, put enough in me to plausibly have me not die. Hmm. Um, and like, it was, it took them long enough to figure out what it was that like, I was uh, like, I was told later that I was basically about a minute, maybe two minutes if I was lucky away from irreversible uh, brain and organ damage, hmm. right? So it's like, Phew. but like, I actually knew exactly <laughs> that was kind of happening because like, I literally felt myself die. Wow. So like the thing that your body does right before you die, especially if you're bleeding out, is like there's only a couple things that you, it needs to protect in order for you to keep living. It's just your heart and your lungs. Mm -hmm. It gives up on your brain, it gives up on all your digestive organs, it gives mm -hmm. up on all the other stuff. It'll, and it'll give up on your extremities. So I was laying there and actually I felt like my fingers first getting super cold, then my hands, then because this is like the blood drawing back to the middle. And mm -hmm. I like felt all the way up to the shoulders like from the toes all the way up to hmm. so it's like basically felt myself dying and uh it's like right around that point all four simultaneous transfusions boo and it's like the strangest feeling ever because it's freezing cold and you usually think like freezing like dead things or it's not like very like you know it's not like a you know warm living thing yeah. if it's cold but it was like as if it was like the deepest breath of oxygen mm. coming through like four super, super cold things, one on each limb. Mm. And that wasn't enough. They had to give me another four simultaneous transfusions right after that. Mm. And then Where was the blood going? The it was leaving just your like body or through, just going? Just, mm. just like into my abdomen, basically. Mm. It's like not useful if it's not in your vascular system. It is not in your right. brain. So, yeah. Right. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> I guess this was a little bit worse than my experience. Yeah, you thought you took it Well, he said, he said, if it doesn't kill you. It doesn't you. kill you. you said and I was that. like, oh, yeah, okay. Well, that's fine. There's a story around that. But, 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 yeah, yeah. 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 But, I mean, the important thing is I woke up the next morning. Well, actually, there's one other, like, nerdy yeah. point about it, which is, like, the, the, the nurse kept, like, asking. It's like, hey, you know, tell me your name. Tell me your name. And it's like, why are you annoying me with this stuff? Because, like, what I was... And I found out in the morning that like uh, that they were doing that because if you don't keep using your brain, then like it'll it'll shunt all that blood out of your brain and your brain will die before you know even get to the point that I got to. But what I was actually using my brain for is I was like looking at the numbers on the machines and I was calculating how much time I had left to live and like whether the decay of these numbers was more like Newton's laws of cooling or whether it was more fluid. <laughs> I was like, why are you distracting me with this name shit? <laughs> Shut up. I've almost got it worked out. <laughs> so, yeah. so anyway, yeah. Yeah. the last thing is like I woke up the next morning and, yeah. and like th there had been enough transfusion by then that like more than half my blood had been transferred out. Your body's mostly liquid. A lot of that is blood. Mm. I figured like actually this morning by mass, I'm probably more other people than myself. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and that like wow. I'm only alive because of like you know there's like eight or ten people that I'll never meet. Yeah. You know like so 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 it's like I'm alive because of the generosity of like you know ten people I'm never gonna meet. Hmm. And it's like it made me like think about like the way that I was doing business, being a leader, running teams, and I was like this is not the way. Yeah. 
I mean, it's like, it's, it's actually, it's easy and it's excuse to be like, oh, I can just take on more, mm. Mm. right? That, that's like the easy way out. Yeah. And it's like, and we applaud it so much in society, but like at that moment, I was like, it's not true. Like all of us, uh, none of us are alone and like not even in just like the, you know, like the, we have to be mentors in all that sort of way. Mm. It's like, yes, eight people, 10 people's blood was in me that morning, but like every single thing I had succeeded at was supported by thousands of people, yeah. right? You know, millions of people. And like, we, we have this like local illusion. It's like, well, we're just gonna take on more. And when we push harder, it's gonna, it's gonna get through. And the hero, like uh, entrepreneur illusion. And we do it all the time now too. It's like, you know, it's the Steve Jobs, the Elon Musk. It's like the here, it's like, you know, I know a lot of the other people that work with those people. Yeah. And it's like, that's not true either. Yeah. It's totally. all, it's all no, fake. It's yeah. So it's like, why do we make this thing up? And for me, I had to learn the lesson by basically dying. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it happened before I was 30. So it's like, I had a little bit of time since then to work on it. So, so, yeah. <laughs> so I think, I think it's, uh, <laughs> I lost a few pints of drop, but uh, not just listening to him. <laughs> I, I, I give you a hug, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy you survived. No wow. kidding. Well, I, I think I think this is a real thing, though, which is um, we oftentimes glorify the struggle and the failure, um, and we don't talk about. You, you said like if it doesn't kill you, but actually it does. Literally, it does literally kill people. Mm. It literally takes lives. The amount of stress that an entrepreneur can take on. And so, and, and I mean, I know your failure, you, you couldn't touch work for a year. Yeah. You travel the world, you flew airplanes into volcanoes, and we'll go to that later. That's a true story. Um, literally did. Um, it almost killed you in that sense. Um, and uh, we could end with that story, because it's so cool. But, um, but actually, I, I, just want, I just want to talk, like, for a moment, the sincerity of how real failure is, um, and stress can be, and anxiety can be, and taking it on your shoulders, and I'm... Curious, you know, what advice you have to this room of entrepreneurs who are going to stop at nothing short of bending the arc of history in the right direction. Um, how you do that and manage the anxiety and the stress and the certain failures, because it's a path to success. You have to fail. Um, I mean, what techniques you've learned along the way to make certain that that doesn't happen again or to make certain that you don't have to pause your life for a year just to get back in shape. Well, one of the things that uh, happened to me once, uh, as Daniel says, uh, I couldn't uh, do anything for a year. I just didn't know because you lose your purpose in life, especially since the message had come to me through a dream. I thought mm -hmm. the universe was talking to me, showing me something of the future. So all of a sudden, the rug is pulled from underneath you and you just say, is there a universe there? Is there a God there? Is there you know, communication, whatever, you lose all of your thing. And you lose your whole value system because you say, what am I doing? Uh, making money was not important. Uh, being famous was not important. All those things, I had it in younger uh, ages, uh, so uh, before I was 30. So it uh, just didn't mean anything. And uh, the fact that I traveled around the world and met a lot of different cultures and uh, learned about uh, how every one of the countries I visited, they believed that their race was the best and their language was the best and their God was the best. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they were so, such a great believer, like none of them had ever talked to their neighbor. And uh, <laughs> it, it just was crazy to me. And I studied a few of these languages and I, you know, I would uh, immerse myself in some of these cultures, learn about it, and I said, God damn, you guys should talk to your neighbor. And uh, they say the same goddamn thing. And they believe their God is the best. And everybody else will go to hell except them and all of that. And, you know, so I, I just, uh, all of a sudden, the light bulb went on that uh, there is a mission for me. And the fact that I went and experienced this pushed me to say, do something meaningful. And what yeah. was meaningful for me was I... This was 1992, and internet was just coming along, and uh, I just, uh, light bulb went on that my mission in life is to go and increase the bandwidth of the internet and reduce the price of the access to the internet. And uh, 
you know, this uh, became the philosophy for the next seven companies that I started. And when you do something that uh, uh, is on the right path, amazing things happen and uh, good things. Two more multi-billion dollar companies. But the key thing was my wife and I were saying, hey, why don't we put our money to go and do something that's really meaningful, to go mm. and connect the whole world around. In 1996, we started schools online, and between 1996 and 2003, we worked in 6,400 schools in 36 countries to bring broadband for free, to donate computers to them, to set up computer labs, get the internet uh, revolution started all over the world. And, you know, this, this was the biggest thing. Yeah, it would have never come to me yeah. had I not gone through that whole process of failing, failing miserably, because had Momento been successful, I, I would be a monster. I would be thinking <laughs> I'm God of the world and I can't do anything wrong and whatever, whatever, oh. whatever, which is this yeah. stupid thing. And knowing that, hey, you are just human being and you are looking for answers yeah. was the biggest lesson for me. I, I wouldn't yeah. trade it for anything. So, Tom, what would be your perspective? Two entrepreneurs, you know, failure, anxiety, stress, it almost killed you, literally. Mm. Um, I mean, what, what can you tell us about how to not repeat that, how to learn from your mistakes? I think there's the idea that, like, it all needs to come from you or most of it needs to come from you. And there's, like, one day where I was, like, thinking, you know, you know, I didn't invent photosynthesis or gravity or electromagnetism. <laughs> Are you sure? I, I, didn't, I didn't invent any of the words that I'm using to think this totally. sentence. Yeah. Like most of like what I'm making in my life is like, you know, like a little nudge on top of all this stuff yeah. that, you know, I just had the gift of being born into. Mm -hmm. And like even the way that we think about like our, our heritage and like our family and whatever, it's like, oh, you know, like number one, we only trace like father's line, which doesn't make any sense. But it's like, you know, people are like, oh, here are my parents. Well, here's the math. Like, you, like genetically you're roughly 50% of each parent. Yeah. It means like quarter of each grandparent. Yeah. But you do the math a little bit more and it's like, well, that means like 10 generations ago, I'm like one tenth of a percent of a thousand people. Huh. <laughs> and 10 generations is only 250 years. Wow. So it means like 250 years ago, like a thousand people needed to exist for me to exist. Yeah. Like think wow. about like how many people contributed, <laughs> even just on the basic genetic biological level. Yeah that you could exist in this moment. And like really then maybe my, my point in life is to do like another 0.1%. And then it becomes like a lot easier. Like I was carried forward by all these people, you know, like just that, and that's the direct lineage. That's like outside of, and like, and the reason I don't like the father's line thing is like, well, I'm just as related to my mother's father's mother's mother's father's mother's mother, 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 father's mother, right? It's like, it's like, why is this person any less important of yeah. the thousand? than the, the one who like passed on the last hmm. name. So it's kind of like, I, I sat with that for a moment and I, I realized actually comparatively how little I need to do hmm. compared to how much I got. <laughs> <laughs> right? I got all of that, I got all of the history of biology, I got all of the history of the formation of the planets and the stars. And, like This was all the stuff that I got on day one. Yeah, but you had to learn it and you did an amazing job of learning all of this and synthesizing. I mean, this mm. guy knows everything. I mean, I, 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 I'm so pissed off at him. I really am. I, really I want to hear the wisdom though. Finish that punchline, where are you going? <laughs> but it's just like, even if you got like a big, big task, yeah. like if you just accept that like your life is going to be to do that 0.1%, mm. it will be a new different 0.1% and it will be your 0.1% that you do. Mm. Uh, and that will become the, you know, be passed on to folks 10 generations from now that have inherited that 0.1% from you. It's like that sensibility of the continuum, you know, that like makes you feel just more grounded and connected. Mm -hmm. Like even if you are understood or not understood in your time, you know, even if like your stuff ends up working or not working, like trust me, like a thousand people from 250 years ago, it's a whole mixture of like yeah. successes and failures and whatever. But it's like it all added up to this right now, you know, and my chance to do 0.1%. So, so I, I just feel like, 
you know, there's a type of uh, aggrandizing that we do, like both in terms of like the negative and the positive. Like you yeah. take it on the negative, it's like catastrophizing. Yeah. And like everything is like the next outrage and the next like, you know, just, you know, imminent doom and the next whatever. And then on the positive side, it's like, I'm the greatest entrepreneur ever or whatever. I, like I, you know, there's like 62 people that have as much, you know, the richest 62 people have as much wealth as the bottom three and a half totally. billion. And like people get upset by that, but I know six of them. And it's like a lot of people like look at those people and like, oh, they're these amazing people. It's like, really, I could pick any two people off the street, three people off the street, and the collectively those two or three people would have more skills and intelligence <laughs> than any of those people. Yeah. Right? And I personally know them. Mm. So it's like I think because like we look at these net worth, you know, like because that's many orders yeah. of magnitude, where it's like, well, that person's a million times more important than me. Yeah. Or a thousand times more talented than me. It's like, no. It would be crazy if they were a factor of three different than you. Yeah. It, you, it would be like, it's like, and I actually, I know a bunch of them and they aren't. Yeah. So like when you work it out, like really anybody that you look at, it's all like within reach. You know, it's, it's like, if, if you think that person's like amazing, like grab two buddies and like, you know, between the three of you, you're more amazing for sure. <laughs> Maybe the three of you are going to go do that thing. Don't get confused by net worth. You know, yeah. net worth is not human. And many of those are torture yeah. souls also. Totally. I mean, uh, knowing a number of them, uh, yeah. God, I, I feel sad for them. I mean, when I see them, when I spend time with some of them, some of them are like them, but some of them, I feel sad for them. It's uh, like, uh, God, how could this person live such a rich life? I mean, it's really, <laughs> when somebody cannot sleep more than a few hours per night, you know that demons are coming and they have horrible dreams and mm -hmm. the things are yeah. coming there. It's uh, just uh, as simple as that. Uh, you listen, uh, you read, uh, you know, about uh, Mukesh Ambani's uh, home in Bangalore that is, uh, what, $1 billion, 27 Mumbai. stories? Yeah. In Mumbai, sorry. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, $1 billion he spent or while, and then he was on the, one of the interviews saying he never could spend one night there because he couldn't get a good sleep. Yeah. And he just, he just say, yeah. what the hell is use yeah. of it? If you could sleep on a mat outside, you are a much <laughs> luckier person yeah. than that 27-story monstrous, uh, I don't know, architecture. I mean, my joke is like, you have money problems until you have boat problems. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be uninvited from all these boats. Thanks, Tom. But, <laughs> I, I, th I, th I, think, I think that's a beautiful line to end Oh, good. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, if you have boat problems, call me. <laughs> I'll help you out. So, um, then you I, get I, to airplane problems. <laughs> unfortunately, and everybody should ask Comrade about the volcano and the airplane, but we don't have time tonight. Um, and what I want to do is just close out and acknowledge um, the depth of humility and humanity that you both have. I, and what I loved about this is you put your greatest failure on every license plate that you've ever had. Um, and the way that you stay grand, grounded is humility. And I, at least my takeaway from this conversation is that humility and humanity are the ways to persevere through anxiety, stress, and failure. I think that's a very beautiful lesson for us all to digest. So thank you both. So thank much. you.